Today's goal is to elevate your drone photography with Colin Smith on Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all the stories and challenges that happen in between. And on every show, I try and get some different kind of photographer, because even if you get two landscape photographers, you end up in a scenario where they could shoot the same subject matter, right? They could both go to arches and end up with completely different photographs. But one type of photography I have never had on the show is drone photography. So we're going to get into that a little bit today before we do the standard housekeeping stuff. If you would be so kind, head by iTunes, drop us both a star rating and a review. Make sure that you leave it on the current feeds, which actually have the word audio or video. We do have both feeds, by the way, if you want to watch a video of it. Uh, audio or video, make sure that you leave it on the right feeds. The old network feed is still in there, but it's deceased. It has not been updated in well over a year at this point. As well, you can always reach out to me. You can hit me up on Facebook at Steve Brazel Photography, behind the shot dot t, uh, excuse me, behind the shot podcast on Facebook. And you can always head by the website, which is stevebrazel.com. It's the same as the country of Brazil, but two L's. Or the website for this podcast is BehindTheShot.tv, and today's episode, as with every single episode, we will have a blog post associated with this episode. So let's get into my guest today. I've wanted to have Colin on for quite some time. I met him originally at WPPI. He was introduced to me by a mutual friend of ours, Troy Miller, and we started talking and we ended up at a Miller's party, Miller's printing party discussing podcasting and YouTube and all kinds of things for a half an hour or an hour or so. So Colin Smith, welcome to Behind the Shot. Hey, Steve. Good to see you. Nice to have you here. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. And so I want people that are that are either listening to this or watching this that don't know of you. My guess is they probably know your work and they're just not associating the name. You're based in Southern California. In fact, you're not actually that far from me. But what you're known for is your HDR stuff, your digital artist, your Photoshop and Lightroom stuff, and drone photography. But the biggest thing, Photoshop Cafe. Tell me about Photoshop Cafe. Okay, yeah, I actually have several aliases. People might know me by um, Photoshop Cafe, Kiwi Colin, Pixel Overload, different names I've gone by over the years. Um, I never actually wanted to use my name at first, but uh, Photoshop Cafe, I actually started that in the year 2000, believe it or not. So we're actually having our 20th anniversary this year. So um, next year, Photoshop Cafe will be old enough to drink. Wait a minute. Um, You've been doing Photoshop Cafe for 20 years? Yep. I'm one of the original gangsters. Wow. That, that's okay. So Photoshop Cafe, you've had over 30 million visitors to Photoshop Cafe. What is Photoshop Cafe? Um, Photoshop Cafe in a nutshell is a free resource for Photoshop users. So it was actually started originally uh, just doing tutorials. And this is before YouTube or social media or anything like that. Um, and I just created tutorials, usually about once a week. I just write a tutorial and put it up on the website, just essentially just to help people, not to make money or run a business out of it. I was working as a, a designer at the time. Um, so I had a good job, didn't need to make money off it. Um, and then it just kind of grew, kind of, I didn't expect it to get as popular as it did. And um, and at that time, way back then, I was doing photorealistic illustration and I was approached by friends of Ed to ask me to do a book, New Masters of Photoshop. And I did something in there. I had no idea what was going to happen, but my website absolutely blew up after that. Um, and, you know, from there, you know, expanded into a community, started doing, you know, contests and different things like that. Then uh, became publishing, started doing premium um, training as well. Um, everything, by the way, that was free is still free and will always be free. Um, but it's, then we, it's you know, interesting we, you I, mentioned publishing, by the way. I did not realize, as much as I've known about you, I didn't realize until I started researching you for this show, you've done over 20 books, is it? Um, yeah, actually. And, and I don't even consider that the publishing because that's me as an author. Um, I've written 20 books. My drone book was actually my 20th. Uh, but as a publisher, I also publish content. We have about 30 different authors that work with us. Um, the, one of the things I dread is when people ask me, what do you do? Because I really don't know how to answer that in, in one sentence. I really need to work on that. 
Um, cause there's just so many different things, you know, that I've done throughout the years. Um, I just enjoy variety and I enjoy creativity. So, you know, I just don't want to limit myself. Well, and, and your latest book, you mentioned the Photoshop, the, the photographer's guide to drones. You've also got Photoshop most wanted do everything with Photoshop. You are featured in the, uh, in the hall of fame books, uh, masters of Photoshop vol- volumes one and two. You've been in Macworld, you've been in Photoshop User Magazine, Shutterbug, and from a from an affiliation point of view, and this kind of to me leads to uh, to kind of where you are professionally at this point. You're an X-Rite Colorado master, you're an Adobe Max master, and you are a DJI expert, which makes sense with obviously the drone photography that you do. But I also didn't realize the type of clientele that you had. What are some of the big clients that you've worked for? Um, well, in different capacities, um, you know, I've done some stuff for Microsoft, Adobe, Apple, you know, those are names obviously people know. I did a lot of work for Toyota Tires, uh, a lot of stuff in the entertainment industry. Um, Procter and so, Gamble, I saw that name in there somewhere too. Uh-huh, um, yeah. And you're an educator. And, and really, the education side of it is where I think of you with Photoshop Cafe and your YouTube channel. Because like you say, everything's free. And you have all these tutorials. And if you go watch Colin's Photoshop Cafe YouTube channel, you're going to find really interesting variety of videos from photography to processing to gear. Um, You were just at W or not WPBI. You were at NAB and you were doing videos on the showroom floor, testing out gear, including a microphone I really want from Rode, the Rode Wireless Go. You've spoken at Photoshop World. You've spoken at WPBI. So really... You're not just a photographer, right? You've got this, for lack of a better phrase, really well-rounded background having to do with creativity. Yeah, I'm very fortunate. Um, You know, my passion is art, um, and that goes from music, photography, you know, illustration, the whole, the whole day I love um, art, but also uh, growing up, my parents were business people. um, So I got an entrepreneurial bug from them. So I'm an artist and an entrepreneur. When... If you were on an island, which kind of relates to the picture we're going to talk about today, too. But if you were on an island and you could only do one of the many things that you do, would it be photography or would it be more towards the graphic design end? Where would you go? I would probably just favor sleeping and eating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And drinking. Got to have a drink now and then. And, and drinking, yeah. I'd like to have some rum on the island. I think that'd be pretty neat. Oh, I got a great rum for you if you like. Are you a rum drinker? I, I do like rum occasionally. Siesta yeah. Key Rum. They're out of Sarasota, mm. Florida, and it's one of the best rums you'll ever have. Um, so there, a little plug for Siesta Key Rum. So All right. let's get into the photograph that we're going to talk about today. And before I bring it up, for those of you that are on the audio feed, make sure that you go to the website, which of course is behindtheshot.tv. We will have a blog post associated with this episode with uh, some information about Colin, all the links for Colin for Photoshop Cafe, although they're really easy. And if you're watching the video, they're popping up uh, underneath him throughout the whole show anyway. But we'll also have a small gallery of his work and the shot that we're going to talk about today, which makes it easier for you to see it before you listen to the audio feed. But with that said, I'm going to bring up the shot and I'm going to try and describe it for those that are on the audio feed. This is a panorama shot. This is filling the screen with bars at the top. It's very, very wide. And it is a tropical island with some lights on a small little island, but a beautiful beach on the right. There's one of those over the water huts on the left. The sky is this beautiful, just kind of tropical feel. You can see through the water, but you're off the ground, right? You're over the water and in the air. And that's really probably the best that I can describe this thing. So. Where is this shot? This is actually on the big island of Hawaii in Kona. Really? Uh Uh-huh. I would have never... You know what's funny is I the the picture you sent me had GPS coordinates in it. When I pulled it up, there was actually nothing where the GPS (laughs) coordinates were. Where on the big island is this? Um, That is like in the Kona side. Okay, so you're, you're... Oh, wow. Because it's beautiful. I want to go here. It, right? <laughs> it is. It is a beautiful spot. So this is a drone shot. So what drone or drones do you normally use? 
Um, yeah. So one of the things that a lot of the time seeing things from a drone is, you know, from a different viewpoint, sometimes you see places you're familiar with and they look completely different um, because of, you know, just that different viewpoint um, that you just wouldn't get any other way. So um, the drones I fly are all DJI, um, not because I'm a DJI expert or anything like that, but just frankly, they make the best drones and they're almost the only ones making drones now. Uh, but this particular shot was shot on a Phantom 4 Pro. Um, my favorite one right now, though, is the Mavic 2 Pro. Um, and I have everything from, you know, the original Phantom. I have an Inspire 1 Pro. I have the Mavic Air. I, you know, pretty much everything that DJI has made, I have one of. Um, why? Why? I'm curious about this one. It's interesting you say that. So you have all of these drones. And yeah, I mean, if you're going to fly a drone and you're not doing it for a movie set where you have one of the giant ones, you're going to fly most likely a DJI. Why do you like the Mavic 2 versus the the Phantom? You know, there's a lot of things. Um, the Mavic series versus the Phantom, the big thing is portability. Uh, it folds up, the legs fold up, the controller is way smaller. Um, the uh, controllers come out, they fold in, so it's very okay. portable. And uh, when it folds up, I can throw it in my camera bag and it literally takes up the size of a lens. So if I had a 70 to 200 lens, the drone doesn't take up any more space than that. So but that's go, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. So that's portability. So for convenience, but for me, that's not enough because I care about imaging quality. I'm willing to suffer a little bit because you know what? I'm always hauling stuff around. I'm that guy. When I went to NAB, you know, I had two bags and I had one t-shirt and a pair of socks. I mean, everything was gear everywhere I go. I'm hauling more gear than I am clothes. Um, so, you know, you're being inconvenienced anyway, so you want to get the best shot. But the big thing about the Mavic 2 Pro is the camera. Um, you know, it's a DJI are a big owner now of Hasselblad. And so they put a Hasselblad camera on there. Now, when I say a Hasselblad camera, I mean, I believe it still has a Sony sensor. Um, but the thing about it is the color science in it is just absolutely beautiful. In fact, I wish I'd had it when I took so this picture. If, like, I don't own a drone. And... I, I've always wanted to go get a drone and I have friends who do. I just don't know that where I live, I would travel to, to drone anywhere. But if I'm looking to buy a drone, we'll promise people, we'll get back to the shot in a minute. If I'm looking to buy a drone, why would, because everything you just said is I'm going for the Mavic 2 and I probably would if I were to buy a drone. I kind of already know that. So why would I go to the Phantom or the bigger ones? Um, the Phantom actually has a pretty good camera on it um, that has, you know, the Sony RX100 sensor on it, I believe. So, um, which is similar to what's on the Mavic. Honestly, you know, some people believe that the camera is better on the uh, on the Phantom, but honestly, I, I wouldn't. I mean, the Phantom came out before the Mavic, so... Honestly, the only reason you would buy the Phantom is because it's less expensive. Is it more stable in certain wind scenarios? No. Because of, because um, it's a lot bigger, obviously. It's bigger. Um, it's very stable. I mean, it's a great, great drone. In fact, up to the Mavic 2 Pro, the uh, Phantom 4 Pro was my favorite, favorite drone, hands down. Um, you know, I, I have the other Mavic, the Mavic Air, the original Mavic, Mavic Pro, um, and just no comparison with the quality of the sensor and the lens on there. Um, yeah, but honestly, the I've tested them and I've got a video on YouTube, you know, where I did a 4K test and I compared the Phantom 2 Pro, uh, sorry, the Phantom 4 Pro and the Mavic 2 Pro. And, you know, you can see the images for yourself. If you look at it in 4K, you can just see that the Mavic is sharper, uh, colors are better. Um, like, Interesting. honestly... Money would be the only reason because the Mavic 2 Pro is, you know, is around fifteen hundred dollars. What's and then for? if you get the smart controller, then you're looking at a couple of grand. Uh, the Phantom 4, I'm not sure what it is right now, but you can also get a Phantom 4 Advanced for around about a grand, and that has exactly the same camera and sensor as the Phantom 4 Pro. Um, and the nice thing about that is just a little bit cheap because it doesn't have the side sensors. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. See, I got to get into this. I need to. I need to go out and do some droning with you. So this shot, I looked up the EXIF data that's in the shot. And of course, this is, this is, well, actually I should ask, this is not a single shot panorama, right? No, there's actually 50 images in this particular shot. I'm sorry, shot. how many? Uh, 50. You've got 50 shots here? Yeah. 
Okay, so again, not a drone guy. You can control the exposure as you're doing it. Uh, you can if you want to do it manually. It has an AEB in there. Um, and the reason there's so many images is because one thing, and I've been nagging DJI about this for a long time, one thing that sucks is that the um, AEB only does 0.7 of a stop. So this is an HDR panorama. It's actually 10 images, but each image is stacked with five oh. images. So you've so got each five one exposures, 10 mm -hmm. shots for the panorama itself. Exactly, yeah. And so did you manually adjust those different exposures for the HDR? No. Um, if I did, I that would have taken a long time. <laughs> and, uh, not, and not just that, but I wouldn't have probably had so to how do you how did you calculate I, the exposures? Um, it has auto exposure bracket. So okay. basically you just find the exposure that you want and then you lock it in, put it, hit exposure lock, hit AEB, and then you set it to five images. Now I only needed three, um, but I had to do five because it only goes 0.7. So if I want to go one and a half stops over, one and a half stops under, right. and a regular shot, I have to do that. And it's particularly a situation like this, you know, where we're in twilight, you know, or, or dusk. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of dark areas, a lot of bright areas. So, you know, this is a extremely uh, high dynamic range scene. So you need that. Okay. So this is, this is, again, if, if you're listening to this or watching this and, and thinking, Steve's really an idiot when it comes to drones, you would be correct. You get this drone, I mean, this is going to be such a basic question. I apologize. You get this drone up in the air. Mm -hmm. You're going to... If this is 10 shots, I'm guessing it's both a horizontal and vertical pano. Correct. So you have multiple shots vertical and multiple shots horizontal. You, you right, position yeah. the drone, mm -hmm. let's say at shot square number one, it fires off five. Mm -hmm. Do you then have to manually adjust the drone and pan or is this completely... Is this completely automatic where you say, I want you to start in this upper right corner. I want you to end in this lower or upper left corner. I want you to end in this lower right corner, calculate how many shots you need and do it. And it runs through the, the sequence. That would be really nice. Um, so there's actually a two part answer to that. Um, DJI have put an auto panorama in there where you can choose if you want to do a horizontal vertical panorama, a 180, 360. But the problem with that is there's no bracketing in there. Um, there's other third-party apps such as Lychee and things like that that do different things, which I've never used. Um, so no, if you want to do an HDR panorama, you have to do it manually. And also, if you really want to get a nice pano that you're going to use for uh, a print or something like that, it's better to do it manually as well, because then you can control uh, what's in the middle. Um, so there's five shots across the top. Then I tilt the camera down a little bit, and then I take five across the bottom. So that's why the 10 are there, and in each of those are five shots. Um, you have to do an incredible amount of overlap. Like typically, you know, panorama, you're looking about 30% overlap. When I'm using a drone, I'm doing at least 50% overlap, and the reason for that is because of the camera. It's a wide-angle camera, and things tend to distort a lot. So if you want all your subject matter to not distort, and you want it to stitch better and, and look like this, um, then you have to overlap a little bit more. So Otherwise, that's, things get that's really... a great tip, actually. So the EXIF data showed that this was one fifteenth of a second, which sounds so ridiculously slow when this thing is yeah. floating in the air. It must be pretty stable. It's an F4.5, ISO is 400. And if the EXIF data is correct, and I never know with panos, things get weird when you take stuff in Photoshop. It shows as 8.8 .8 millimeters, which in a 35 millimeter world would be 24 millimeter shot uh, equivalent. So you are, you're panning and overlapping 50% to keep your verticals and horizontals straight. That, that, that's actually really interesting. How do you pre-visualize it though? Because you're going to obviously have to crop. So are you also shooting way beyond way beyond the 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 borders of what you're expecting your final shot to be so that you have cropping room um a lot of the time i am yeah um but what is most important is you know deciding the composition before you take the shot so you're just kind of looking around and you're just deciding okay what is my composition what am i interested where do i want to start where do i want to end 
obviously give it a little bit more, but not too much because then you're also taking more shots. And remember, the drone only has a micro SD card on there. Um, so it takes a lot longer to process. Fortunately, oh. the Mavic 2 Pro has some inbuilt storage. So if I'm going to do an HDR panorama, I make sure that it's saving on board and then I can shoot much faster than if I'm doing to a micro SD card. Okay, again, um, great yeah, tip. Yeah. I And I did not know that it had, what's the onboard storage, do you know? Oh, I, I forget. It's like a couple of gigs, two gigs, four but gigs. But the read-write like obviously is going to be way faster than an SD card, even if you have a fast SD card. Correct. Yeah. And it's a micro SD card, so it's even slower. Yeah. Right, right. Well, you know, you mentioned something. I was going to get into composition later, but I want to touch on it now because you said you have to have your composition in mind before you start shooting because you have to understand how many shots you're going to need. You have to understand what's going to be center, what's going to be above the, the, the fold, as it were. And this is one of those interesting shots to me where the horizon line is dead center, which a lot of people you know, frown on unless it is a reflection type shot. But in a way, even though this isn't really a reflection shot, the symmetry of that centered horizon line really works because you have the palm trees and then the clouds from the palm trees spreading out, kind of matching the way that the island and the reflection of the island goes in the water. There's a nice balance to this thing. I, I'm kind of curious because even though you're in the air, again, for those on the audio feed, you'll you'll understand this more as I say this, you're not way up in the air. You're kind of far away from this small cove, this beach and, and hut, but you're maybe, you're a little higher than roof height. So I'm kind of curious when you're shooting drones, you know, obviously that you can use a drone at any angle. When you're doing a landscape with a drone, are there angles that don't work? Um, I'm glad that you brought that up because um, what it actually comes down to is something that I realized a long, long time ago shooting drones. Um, you know, when you first get in a drone, everyone goes up as high as they can. And a lot of the good shots are not up high, they're down low. Most photographers or, you know, I call them terrestrial photographers. It's, it's, a, it's a, I, I Makes sense, though. I mean, that's really that, what we are. That phrase. Um, so, you know, terrestrial photographers are shooting in two dimensions. Um, I don't know if you know much about 3D, but you're working in a Z axis and you're working in an X axis. Right. The Y axis is height. So when you add a third axis, um, you're not actually adding it, you know, like, oh, now I've got a third more opportunities. You actually go from a squared uh, to a cubed. So exponentially, you've now given yourself three dimensions of um, being able to move and shoot your photographs. Like most photographers wait for the sun to hit a certain spot, you know, the sunrise, the sunset. With the drone, I'll do 10, 20 sunrises and sunsets. I just changed my altitude. So one of the things I, I do want to mention about that is why is it low? Because see the silhouette of the trees against the sky. Right. So I use altitude as a compositional tool. Notice that the building, the hut, is a little bit above. It's peaking above the horizon. It's not It's not a converging line where it's colliding right. with there. And also, it's not getting lost in the ocean. So that was a conscious thought, that hut not intersecting that horizon. Absolutely. At, and at the, the trees. At the edge. At the edge. Yep. And look at the trees, um, all that stuff. Fortunately, I also have a little background in 3D. So I'm used to moving a 3D camera around. And so to me, a drone is like using a 3D camera in the real world. So height is a really, really important thing. And also look at noticing, you know, when you've got, uh, you know, darker areas in the foreground, you're looking for light areas in the background that are uncluttered that you can compose it. Also, there's another thing. If you look at the reflections of the water in the foreground, the reflections of the light, mm -hmm. that changes with altitude. As you go higher, those lights will get shorter and smaller. Just, you know, because if you do a bird eye, Angle you just of reflection. reflection. Yeah. Exactly. So, Part of that also is trying to find it. So you'll see, if you look carefully, you can see the trees reflecting and all these trees are in the frame. See that? So all of that, you know, is why, you know, sometimes I will do a rule of thirds, you know, where if it's a really interesting sky and a boring foreground, I'll shoot for a lot of sky. If it's a boring sky and an interesting foreground, I'll shoot for a lot of foreground. But in a situation like this, I think, it, you know, it's more pleasant to get that symmetry. But at the same time, notice you can see the ocean behind it right. a little bit. And that's, you know, so what I'm looking for is actually creating that negative space by using height as a compositional tool. Yeah. And, and 
Okay, see, you just, wow. And that's the thing. I, I tried to say it and I failed that the center horizon line is so often poo-pooed as, you know, dead center is deadly type thing. But in this case, there's these subtle compositional tools. I mentioned angle of reflectance. And for those of you photographers that are ever tried to that have ever tried to do a portrait of somebody wearing glasses and your lights are reflecting in the glasses. And the old rule is if you if you cheat the glasses down the nose a little bit, you can cut that angle. Well, that's what Colin's done here. The angle of the lights on the little islandy looking thing and the palm trees reflecting in front of you by getting the right height, you actually created perfect mirror symmetry. It's just really subtle with the shadows. I, I absolutely love that. You mentioned on Twitter, because you had mentioned so many people just go high, right? You mentioned on Twitter that Twitter that you don't do a lot of those bird's eye shots, but in your portfolio, you you do have some amazing ones. And it is a unique view if it's done properly. Like you have some looking down on pools of water or trees. Why don't you do more of those? Because you're really good at it. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I just, you know, I, I don't do things gratuitously. If it needs it, then I'll do it. If it doesn't need it, I'm not going to do something just for the sake of doing it. Um, maybe I did that, you know, when I first started flying. Um, but for me, it's about telling a story. And really, it's about the imagination. And so when you're looking at this shot here, say, for example, you know, you're looking into the horizon. The horizon goes off as endless possibilities, right? You could be sailing near what's beyond that horizon. It sparks the imagination. When you do a bird's eye view, it's kind of like over-processing an HDR when there's no shadows. There's no mystery and no shadows anymore. You know, you just open everything up, you know, whereas, uh, you know, before HDR, you wouldn't know what was in the shadows. Your imagination would see things in the highlights. Your mind adds things that are not there. Um, so... I like the top down or the bird's eye view when it's appropriate, when it's an interesting shape, you know, like the waterfall or something like that, because that's an angle people never see a waterfall from. Right. Um, and so I'm not against them. I think, you know, they're fantastic shots. You know, they're great for showing things like textures and patterns. But what you're not getting is, you know, you're not getting reflections a lot. Um you're not getting, you know, sunsets, you're not getting as much atmosphere. So it's a different type of photograph. Um, but you know, once again, I'm not against them when, you know, like the shot I've did of the Pelican, I don't know if you've seen that or the catamaran is actually another example. The catamaran ones I love. And the catamaran people ones actually it. shows your graphic design background. Yeah. A lot but, of people thought that was an illustration. They yeah, thought it was done in Illustrator. Exactly. Yeah. You know, people, you should go look at, at his, at his portfolio because that one really does come across very geometric, very drawing, uh, when you're shooting. Okay. As photographers, we're still capturing light and shadow. Quality of light matters, direction of light matters, color of light matters. You mentioned shooting, you know, multiple from different heights and angles, sunset shots. How much weight do you put on the sun or light position when you're doing drone photography, I guess, I guess really the way to word it is, is it any different for you as a drone photographer worrying about light color, quality, direction, and, and et cetera? Is it any different than a terrestrial photographer? Absolutely. And no. Um, and I'll explain <laughs> what I mean by that. Like one, I not even interested in flying my drone and shooting in the middle of the afternoon. You know, magic hour still applies. Good light still applies. Right, you right. know, quali quality of light, you can't change. That's something you can't fix in post, right? As long as you've got good quality of light, position is so irrelevant because, well, really, I shouldn't say it's irrelevant. Position matters, you know, like a sunrise or a sunset means you're going to be shooting different things, you know, because <laughs> of where the light is. But, you know, the sun, I'll move the drone until I get the sun where I want it. So, you know, if I'm shooting a, a pier or, or, or a you know, a lamp stand saying, I want to have the light coming just that perfect spot. I can maneuver the drone and get to that spot. Um, if there's a puddle and I want the sun to reflect in it, I'll just move, you know, slide side to side, go up and down until I get the sun or the reflection where I want. So, um, so when I'm shooting the position of the sun can really, you can change that. And it's amazing because, you know, the parallax, the sun doesn't move a lot, but your foreground moves a heck of a lot right. when you slide your drone side to side. So, yeah, I mean, as long as it's good quality of light, 
then you can do so much with it. You you did something interesting in this shot, going back to the fact that it's an HDR. This is so realistic looking. I actually didn't know that this was an HDR panel. Because well, I'm you glad tr- to hear that. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> well, and and again, there's there's a time and a place for every tool in your shed, right? So there's a time if you want to go process a, a crazy HDR you know, a Trey Ratcliffe, you know, really on the edge type HDR, there's a place for that and people love it. And there's a place for HDRs that are simply compensating for the fact that our eyes can see more dynamic range than our camera sensors can. And I want to show an image, for example, that the human eye would see. To do that in a high dynamic scenario, I have to do HDR, but a realistic HDR. So this one is very realistic. I mean, I, I actually kind of pictured that I'm sitting on the other side of this lagoon and, and looking at this. It's that real. Do you ever shoot in mind, intending to do the more extreme HDRs, or are all your HDRs tending to go towards the realistic side? Well, I started an HDR a long time ago, and what actually got me hooked on it, and I said a long time ago, like probably over a decade now, um, remember Photomatics, you know, oh, yeah. I was using that at the time. So I first used HDR because of that illustrative effect. Um, but, you know, but it's got to be done right too. It, it can right. be a mess if it's not done right. You know, you don't want halos, you want nice thin lines, you want very detailed lines. Um, so one of the things I did when I shot my original HDRs, if I'm going for that grungy, for lack of a better term, um, I call it textured because I don't really want the grunge. The grunge is, I think, when you're going too far, you want to pop that texture, but you've got to drop the color. So if you have too much color and too much texture, it's sensory overload. So I feel like if I'm turning up the volume on the color, I need to turn down the volume on the texture. If I'm turning up the volume on the texture, I need to turn down the volume on the color. Um, Unless it's something like, you know, Times Square in New York where it's crazy and busy and that's the story I'm that's trying to tell. That's part of the then. story, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I do have some stuff that I've done with the drone, you know, which is more painterly looking, where I've done the HDR, but I also do a lot of dodging and burning and and make it look more painterly, for lack of uh, you know better term, you know, kind of almost Thomas Kincaidy. Um, you know, I do have some stuff like that. Um, but the thing about HDR, I mean, I love HDR, and I think, you know, there's no one can tell you this is right, this is wrong. You know, do it however you want to do it, and if you like it, great. Um, but I think realism is the future of HDR, because the stylized HDR, has, there's, there's two different types of HDR, right? There's HDR as an effect, right, and there's HDR as a necessity. Um, the necessity of HDR, which is bringing out the dynamic range, that was the whole point. That's what it was invented for. That's why, you know, we've got HDR on our TVs. You know, everything eventually is, you know, going HDR. And that's showing detail. So you don't have a blown out highlight. You have color, you have detail in your highlights. You have color, you have details in your shadow. Now, the effect, in my opinion, it's eventually is going to become dated. You know, people are going to see it and it's going to fit into a particular time period, a particular era, maybe, you know, decades in the future. People will do it on purpose and they'll be like, oh, that's that you know, quasi 2010 effect. Oh, right. man, it's such a, you know, wow, you're such a hipster. You know, just think about 2002 that. 2002 like, called 20- and wants their photo back. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that will become an effect, you know, kind of like the 80s, you know, like, you know, in the early 90s, you don't want anything to look 80s. Right. But now it's cool, like, you know, Thor Ragnarok. It's a style. It's As long as you understand it and you use it, um, you know, it's like a buffalo. Everything can be used as long as you understand it and use it correctly. So what would you have a shot like this one that we're talking about today, this this beautiful Hawaii pano? What software would you have processed this in? Uh, same software I use all the time is uh, Lightroom Classic and Photoshop. And so your stitching of the panorama, the multi-shot panorama would have been in Photoshop. So, okay, here's the question I asked Trey Ratcliffe. I'm curious about what actually, you... Actually, believe it or not, no. Um, I actually stitch it in Lightroom. Okay. Lightroom CC has an incredible um, panorama stitching ability. It'll um, do both you know, vertical it, and horizontal at the same time? Uh, yep. Really? Not just that. 
this particular shot, I did a lot of this manually, but I tested it. I did a 90 image HDR panorama last time I was in Hawaii, which was about a month ago. And Lightroom can now stitch an HDR panorama. So I selected all 90 images, click a button and boom. Okay, so then here's the processing question. There's two schools of thought on processing multi-shot HDR, not just multi-shot, you know, single frame HDRs, but panoramic and HDR, where you have multiple shots from a depth point of view and multiple shots from a position point of view. Do you process each individual frame separately? So in other words, would you take square number one, which is five shots deep, dynamic range wise, would you stack those to get a single frame HDR image? Would you do that 10 times so that you end up with 10 shots, process those individually, and then stitch them? Or do you right out of camera, go straight to combining the HDR shots, combining the pano shots, and process the shot as a whole at the end? Well, that's a good question. And uh, whether you do it, you know, using Lightroom or you do it through Photoshop. So sometimes if Lightroom doesn't work, you can do it through Photoshop. And then, of course, if you want to go crazy, like the Gigapixel stuff, you can do you know, PT GUI. I mean, I've done all that kind of stuff in the past, too. But um, you have to build the stacks of HDR first, and then you do the panoramic merge. So in this you case, merge... you'd, you'd have 50 shots. In the, in the case of the mm -hmm. shot, you'd have 50 shots. You stack into each HDR stacks. so you end up with 10 shots. Yep. And then merge those together. Do you, you process the before way, the merge? Fail. Um, no. Okay. So you stack, merge, mm -hmm. then process. Yep. Okay. Interesting. What would you have done to a shot like this as far as processing? Um, actually, quite a lot, believe it or not. Um, so I would like to do a lot of dodging and burning. Um you know, obviously, I'm going to do the overall color correction, the overall color balance, and just get a good clean shot first. That's that's the first step. Then I like to go in and do the dodging and burning. But the nice thing about working with an HDR image is that you're dodging and burning with an incredible amount of detail that you wouldn't have. So normally, you know, you're opening up an area. So maybe I'm using a little bit of, you know, starting off in Lightroom, maybe doing some of the adjustment brush and that adjustment brush is working on the HDR image. Right. So it's not, you know, just brightening out and then blowing out There's detail there. There's more detail in that photograph than you can show at once, especially if you do like a true, um, which sometimes I do not as much as I used to, but sometimes I'll do a 32 bit image into Photoshop and then I'll do my dodging, burning and retouching in the 32 bit space. Um, there's more detail than what you can see. So you're actually pulling out the detail and brightening and darkening certain areas and forcing it into that space so you can downsample it into a 16-bit space. Hopefully it doesn't sound too technical. But, um, but yeah, but technically, you know, it's, it's floating point, meaning that there's more highlight detail and more shadow detail at the same time than your screen is able to show for now. We don't have 32-bit monitors, right? So there's all this space. And what we are doing is essentially forcing those, you're darkening those bright areas instead of lightening them. You're actually darkening them so you can see them. And you're <laughs> lightening those darker areas so you can see them. But there's details, there's an incredible amount of detail in there. So I'm going to do that. Um, and then I'm going to go in, you know, I'm going to do my sharpening. I'm going to do, and, you know, all the usual stuff that you're going to do, you know, if there's any things I don't like in there. I'll grab my clone stamp and get rid of those things. Um, but one of the little tricks that I like to do is I like to take the dodge tool, which I don't use the dodge tool, but I, I create an adjustment layer. And, so you do the 50% um, gray layer in yeah, whatever it is, yeah, exactly. soft light or yeah, overlay. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then I'll use my Wacom tablet and I paint and I'll literally go in there and I will paint into the picture. Um, that's why I didn't do too much. Um, some I've done, you know, really heavy painting, but then one of the things I love to do is see where the reflections is. I like to get very, very close to where the reflections are and just run it along that edge. And it just makes those reflections really pop. Nice. Okay. So here's the question then. Drone photography in general, what's the biggest miscon misconception? Oh boy. Uh, the biggest misconception of drone photography in general. Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, 
I think it depends who, from whose viewpoint, if you're looking at the public, you know, they think we're spying on them, <laughs> which we're not. Um, it's a real wide angle lens. You can't see anything. Um, there's no audio on there, so you can't hear anything. You know, people are like, oh, can you fly up to my window and spy on me? Um, well, no. And, you know, and the funny thing is I, I do most of my stuff at the coast and at the beach and I have people, homeowners come down and say, are you going to fly up to my window and spy on me? And these are people that are on where people are walking. Their curtains are wide open. They've got huge windows and they're sitting there with the whole public, you know, in public view. You know what? If you want privacy, close your curtains. Yeah. You know, the drone doesn't have x-ray vision, uh, you know, so, you know, people, you know, there, there's that whole thing, you know, there's that whole paranoia, misconception. Um, that is one. And then from the general point of view, I think, you know, when people get in a drone for the first time, they want to go as high as they can. And they think by going higher, they're going to get a better shot because you're going to see more. Um, and sometimes there's a time and a place for that, but. Honestly, most of your best shots are like 100 feet, 150 feet and below. So, so if, okay, so if, if somebody got their first drone, Mother's Day is coming up and somebody gave their wife a drone or Father's Day, whatever, or birthday, mm-hmm. whatever. Somebody gets their first drone. What's the one tip that you would give them that work on this one area to get better, faster? Um, I know this is going to sound awfully cliche, um, but the first thing they should work on is safety. Um, okay, good. Um, don't take any chances. I have never, and, you know, touch, I don't think I have any wood in here, but, you know, I've never been hurt from my drone because I, I put safety first. No matter what I do, I put my safety and the safety of other people first. There's no shot that is worth getting, worth jeopardizing people's safety you know so when i see people doing foolish things you know flying over crowds of people at festivals and concerts and you know i just you know it it just makes me upset and of course all there's a lot of regulations and rules in place now because of that is because of idiots and i'll just call them idiots because that's what they are um you know there's no point risking life and limb there's no photo that important okay so once you've got that out of the way uh, the next thing you want to work on is, you know, just getting the hang of the drone, even though there's so many things you can do, automatic modes, you know, the satellites. And that was one of the other things, sorry, from way back. Um, a lot of these shots are uh, one twenty-fifth of a second. Very, very slow shutter speed, but it doesn't matter because they use satellites and the satellites are going to lock them in position and hold them steady. That's why we call them a tripod in the sky. Sometimes I can have 22 satellites I'm locked onto that are going to be holding that drone nice and stable. So you can do really slow shots and you don't have to worry about That explains um, why shake. this was so slow because again, the, the EXIF data on this shot showed one fifteenth of a second, which is, I'm thinking mm-hmm. it's floating. How does that happen? But it's the it's the world and, and technology that we live in. So if people yep. wanna see your portfolio as it were, and again, if you've been watching the video, you've been seeing lower thirds come un- up under Colin with his social media feeds and his and his uh, you know normal website. But for those on the audio feed, if people just want to see more of your photography, where should they go? Um, if you go to PhotoshopCafe.com and then click on the gallery, you'll see a lot of my photography. Or you can go on Instagram. Um, you know, I post something there every day. I try to. That's Photoshop Cafe. Um, Facebook, of course, uh, probably post more pictures on Instagram, also on Twitter. Um, and if you're on Skypixel, um, that's DJI Skypixel, you can find me on there too. Um, so I have some of my pictures there. So as well. you're Photoshop Cafe pretty much everywhere. PhotoshopCafe.com and at Photoshop Cafe everywhere you go, including YouTube. So if you have not visited his YouTube channel, Photoshop Cafe on YouTube, go there too. Yep, absolutely. Colin, and I have I some really tutorials actually on there that um, these kind of photographs, I have some tutorials and I show you guys how I actually do this. Yeah, on and YouTube. this is seriously, when you go to Photoshop Cafe on YouTube, set time aside. Don't just look at the new ones because a lot of your videos, your your archival footage, as it were, is still very, very applicable to what we're doing today. So go through the back catalog of the constant content that, that Colin creates Take a look at some of the old videos, too, because you've got a lot of great stuff up there. Colin, thank you so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Right, thanks. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been an honor. Yeah, I, I, I mean, seriously, I love your work. 
Love the drone stuff. We need to do it again, actually, too. And when you do, I know you ordered that that wireless go from road. Because of you, I'm going to end up ordering one as well. But when you actually get one, I, I will be watching for your video on that one, too. Awesome. Yeah, I should be getting that within the week, hopefully. I think uh, yeah, it ships soon. Send me a notification. It? It's shipping, right? Well, I got it. That's what I thought. It said end of the month, and then I got a notification from B&H um, that it's actually on the way. So I'm really excited to get it. Well, again, Colin Smith, PhotoshopCafe.com, Photoshop Cafe, every social media outlet, including YouTube that you can find. Go check him out, follow him, check out his stuff. He's got a lot of great stuff. And his NAB coverage, actually, again, is where I watched him. I, I had already seen this microphone that we're talking about, and I wanted it. And then he tested it, and my jaw hit the floor. So go check it out. Also, don't forget to head by the website for the podcast and for me. It's BehindTheShot.tv. I've got a full you know, write-up on Colin there, a small gallery of his work. You can subscribe to the podcast there. That's your best bet to make sure that you get the right feed is head on by that website. Of course, you can also always find me on social media. Facebook, there's a personal account. There's a, a podcast account. The podcast account is Behind the Shot Podcast and then Steve Brazel Photography. Twitter and Instagram both. It's at Steve Brazel and at Behind the Shot TV for the two feeds. Make sure that you head by there to everybody, as always. Thank you very, very much for watching the Behind the Shot podcast, for telling your friends about the Behind the Shot podcast. We really do appreciate it. We will always be back every two weeks with another episode, so we will see you then. 